Hi Rocketeers, I'm Charlie Garcia and I'm back with another episode of Liquid Rocket Engine Design. Today, I'll be talking about the injector design process. Injector design can cause almost religious arguments among engineers, as you compare the qualitative and quantitative trades between various types of injector geometries. I won't be able to cover every specific type of injector geometry in today's video, so I'm just going to go over the ones that I considered for my rocket engine and why I selected the one I did. Thank you so much for all the support I received on the last episode. I received so many comments that you wanted me to go even more in depth that I've actually split this episode into half. So this particular episode is going to cover injector geometry selection, and then the next episode is going to talk about how I designed the actual hardware that will be going on the engine. It's becoming tradition to start these videos with a disclaimer, so here's a fun one. Warning! The US government has strong opinions about sharing rocket engine technology with people. During this video series, I will only be presenting materials that you can find in the standard coursework at a US university. In fact, I'm attaching the notes from the propulsion class I took last fall down below. Additionally, this information is significantly in the public domain. You can in fact find most of the material I based this off of by googling TRW Pintle Design Handbook. Spoiler alert. I'll also be linking that in the description below. Okay, let's talk about the objectives of a rocket engine injector. The injector's job is to take all this high pressure fluid and turn it into a well-mixed gas that you can then combust. During this process, the injector is ideally not burning. If your injector is burning during this process, you're only a few seconds away from what we technically call an expensive pile of molten metal. The process of mixing and burning the fuels may sound straightforward, but it's actually not. First, the propellant has to be really well mixed. If it's not, it won't combust completely and you'll lose performance. Secondly, the propellants need to be well atomized, that is, turn into very, very fine liquid droplets so that they can evaporate quickly. Because it turns out that even a really well mixed ethanol liquid oxygen liquid just still won't burn. Finally, you need to be careful about where you spray your propellants. If you spray them right up against your chamber wall, you might accidentally do damage to your chamber wall because of poor mixing, localized hot spots, oxygen-rich spots, or other transient phenomenon. Luckily, engineers have already found several ways to solve all of those problems. The basis for most liquid rocket engine injectors is to crash one stream of propellant into another stream of propellant so hard that they burst into tiny droplets and atomize. There's a whole other theory of design for injectors that inject gases into the combustion chamber if you have a pre-burner or you're using an expander cycle or something like that, but we aren't going to get into that today. Because the droplets are so tiny, they have a large surface area to volume ratio and they rapidly evaporate in the hot combustion chamber environment. You can control where the droplets go by changing how you collide the two streams together. Last episode I mentioned a liquid rocket engine I'd fired several summers ago. This rocket engine right here used gas liquid injection, and you can see how I did the liquid injection right here with this $12 part off of McMasterCar.com titled Garden Hose Spray Nozzle. Yeah, maybe not my proudest moment, but it did work. The year after that, I worked on another rocket engine called Viper. This rocket engine used a dual-unlike impinging injector to crash a small stream of methane into a small stream of liquid oxygen and atomize them. This injector had a ton of tiny holes, and it actually worked really well. We were never able to hot-fire that engine due to some other design problems we had. But we learned a lot from the design process, and that design has had a huge impact on how I'm going to go about making this rocket engine. The dual unlike impinging injector is perhaps the simplest implementation of a rocket engine injector design. Basically, all you do is you drill some holes that connect to your oxidizer channels, and you drill some holes that connect to your fuel channels, and you angle the holes in such a way so that the streams of fuel and oxidizer collide inside of your combustion chamber. You can then change the size of the holes to match the momentum of your oxidizer flow and your fuel flow. This controls where the droplets go after they collide. This design works really well when you have similar mass flow rates of your two propellants. The biggest downside of this design in my mind is that when you manufacture it, you have to drill a ton of really precision tiny holes in a single piece, and if you mess up a single one of them, you have to go back and make the whole thing over again. It also requires a lot of jigs to get all the machining fixtures in the right place, so I'd really rather not make another injector of this type unless I have to. The next injector design I considered is called a coaxial swirl injector. A coaxial swirl injector is a little more complicated but it still breaks down to be pretty simple. Basically, if you take a cylinder and inject fluid along one wall in a tangential direction, it will spin along the outside of that cylinder. When the cylinder ends, the fluid maintains its momentum, and it flies off in a cone. If you then take one of these cylinders and put it inside of another one of these cylinders, you can size it such that the two cones that these throw off are exactly aligned with each other. Then, by spinning the fluid in opposite directions into these two cones, you get a massive interface area between your two propellant streams. This leads to really good atomization and mixing. The really nice thing about this is that each one of the swirl cylinder injector elements happens to be a single piece that then gets bonded inside of a larger injector face. Also, if you change the design later, all you have to do is remachine these tiny swirler elements instead of remachining the entire injector plate. 
Swirlers are awesome, and the really awesome group Copenhagen Suborbitals is doing some amazing work with them right now on their BPM-5 and BPM-100 rocket engines. I don't have any previous experience with the Swirler design, so it's a little unfamiliar to me, and I'd feel a little uncomfortable trying to design it straight away to use in my engine. So I'm going to pass on this one, but I'll keep it in mind for future designs that I might want to work on. While you've been watching this, I've been playing some B-roll of me demonstrating these injector geometries using tiny 3D printed parts and a car wash pump. The car wash pump can be gotten off of Amazon for about $25, and if you're a science educator that would like these STL files of these injector elements to use as demonstrations in your classroom, let me know. I'll shoot them your way. For everyone else, I'm planning a kind of repository for all the publicly available files that are generated in the course of this project. I probably won't be able to release the engine design publicly, <clears throat> ITAR, but everything that I can share, I will. The design I ended up selecting is called a Pintle Injector. Over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to deep dive all the different design choices you can make within a pintle injector and why I decided to go with them. A pintle is characterized by a propellant moving axially down a cylindrical element and a propellant moving radially outwards from inside of that cylindrical element. Pintles were developed for the descent stage of the lunar lander back in the 1960s, and since then, they've been used on a ton of launch vehicles and in a variety of engines. They're very scalable, and they're super useful, especially for throttleable engines. Pintles are relatively simple to turn in what's known as a variable area injector. That is, you can mechanically change the amount of orifice area you have injecting propellant into your rocket engine. This makes it easier to deep throttle a pintle injector engine than some other types of engines. Deep throttling is an important feature if you're trying to, say, land a rocket. To elaborate on that, pintle element injectors can either have a sleeve to make them variable injector geometries or not. If you use that sleeve to completely shut off all propellant flow to the engine, that's what's known as a face shutoff pintle. Face shutoff pintles are a super cool design because you could use them to shut the engine down with almost no lag and with almost no residual propellant. This means that you could protect your engine in the case of a failure upstream in the engine or if you're about to deplete your propellant. The pintle sleeve can be pneumatically, hydraulically, or electrically actuated. Hydraulic and electric actuation lets you carefully control the position of the pintle sleeve and do throttling. You could probably do this with pneumatic control, but it would be a little bit more complicated. Next, we need to talk about where the propellant is in the pintle injector itself. The pintle construction consists of that long cylindrical body and then the annular orifice that allows fuel to run down the outside of that body. So you can pick what propellant runs through the center of that body, and the options are either you can put fuel through it or the oxidizers through it. And so you call that either fuel-centered or oxidizer-centered. To be honest, I can't see a clean way to do a fuel-centered pintle and a fuel regen jacket around the engine. So I didn't even think about this one very hard, and went ahead and selected the aux-centered pintle to enable me to do a regen cooled chamber. Finally, you need to think about how you're going to support the pintle in the engine, as well as the pintle tip inside the pintle body. For the pintle tip inside the pintle body, I went ahead and did a cruciform support structure, as opposed to threading the pintle and threading it into the pintle body. The cruciform support structure still uses a threaded attachment to hold the tip into the cruciform support, but it can be a much smaller thread, so instead of needing to single point thread a very thin walled part, I can just get a tap and die set and do it normally. Doing a cruciform support structure requires a slightly larger pintle body in order to accommodate the area that is taken up by the cruciform support structure, but that's not really a constraint here. With all those choices made, I had everything I need in order to start designing my pintle injector, so let's sit down and do some math. Just briefly to confess my sins, I'm using Q here as a velocity because I don't know what else to use for flow velocity, even though that's normally a volumetric flow measurement. The first thing I did was sit down and write some design code. These codes are in order to allow me to quickly calculate exactly how much area I need for a given pressure drop over my injector. You need a pressure drop over your injector, firstly, to keep the fire out of your feed lines, because in a pure oxygen environment, even solid aluminum plumbing looks a lot like a fuel source. Secondly, you need a pressure drop over your injector elements to give your flow some velocity. This flow is what gives you the flow energy to impinge your two propellants and atomize them. Why do you need a pressure drop in order to get a flow velocity? Well, it's really simple. It's Bernoulli's equation. This is where we hit our first snag. The engine, at least the first version of it, won't have pumps. I don't have the money, time, or expertise to develop perfectly balanced turbo machinery, and as much as I'd like to, I think it's out of scope for this first engine project. This means that my pressurization valves, which I've already purchased, are the limiting factor to how high of a combustion pressure this engine can have. And since the combustion pressure has to be lower than the feed pressure, which has to be lower than the tank pressure, I have a limited pressure budget to work with. I have a similar problem with the engine thrust. My regulators can only provide about 1.3 liters per second of gas to the tanks, which means that I can't supply any more fuel than that to the engine. If you remember last episode, we talked about 1,200 pounds of thrust was the largest size of engine that I could design and build. It was mostly because I was limited by the regulators that I have access to. We're digressing, though. 
I don't want to waste any pressure in between the tanks and the combustion chamber in order to have the highest pressure engine possible. This means that we want the lowest pressure drop over the injector that's practicable and safe. So I'm targeting the low end of acceptable pressures. If you think I'm about to seriously regret that decision, you should let me know in the comments below. Preferably along with links to papers and data and test results. Now, I'm targeting an injection velocity of about 20 meters a second for my pintle injector. The problem though is that I'm injecting about 40% more liquid oxygen than I am ethanol. That means that in order to get a perfect 45 degree cone off of my pintle, I need to match the momentums of the two propellants. This means that I need to inject the ethanol faster. In order to make up for the 40% higher mass of oxidizer being injected, I need to inject the fuel 40% faster. Now that I know the injection velocities, it's easy to calculate what the injector areas need to be. The liquid oxygen has an injector area of 63 square millimeters, and the ethanol has an injector area of 43 square millimeters. So now we need to convert these areas into actual machinable features on the injector. At this point in the design process, it's important to think about how I'm going to actually manufacture this part. My plan to machine this element is first to turn a blank, and then to use a slotting saw on a mill to put slots down here for the oxidizer flow. The size of the annular element for the fuel injection will be controlled by the difference in spacing between the pintle body and the dome. I can only buy the slotting saw I'm going to use to produce the oxidizer slots so thin. And because of this, I'm limited in the thickness of this slot that the oxidizer will be coming out of. The smallest slitting saw I can find is 2.13 millimeters thick, so we know that's going to be the width of the saws. I have an indexing head that can do 24 slots, but that seems like it leaves very little material for the structure of the pintle tip, so I'll only be doing 12. With 12 2.13 millimeter wide slots, they need to be about 2.5 millimeters tall. Next, we need to size the annular orifice. This is another simple geometry calculation. All we need to do is calculate the outer diameter of this sleeve. The outer diameter of the annular orifice depends on the inner diameter of the pintle body. I know the pintle body will be one inch in diameter. There will also be a part sliding over the pintle body, called the sleeve. The sleeve will take up an extra sixteenth of an inch on the outer diameter of the pintle body. So then we know that the inner diameter of the orifice for the fuel is going to be one and one sixteenth inch. For all you metric users out there, that's 26.9 millimeters. This means that the outer diameter of the annular orifice is going to be 27.9 millimeters. That's a really tight tolerance, having to hold a one millimeter gap all the way around that orifice element. In order for this to work, I need the pintle body to be exactly centered inside of the annular element. Otherwise, I won't get enough fuel flow on one side, and I'll get too much fuel flow on the other side. This will result in poor mixing and incomplete combustion. The part that controls the exact location of the pintle body will be discussed in the next episode. For now, we're going to assume that I have the ability to perfectly center the pintle body in the annular orifice. If hitting those tolerances proves to be difficult, I can make the pintle body a little smaller. If the pintle body is a little smaller, the annular gap will be a little wider, giving me more room to hit the tolerances necessary to make this part work. In the next episode, we'll be a lot more practical. We'll be looking for leak paths, designing seals, designing a valve seat, sizing a really beefy spring, and thinking about the startup sequence. If you aren't subscribed already, and that sounds like something you'd like to watch, check below. There's a big red button where you can fix that. As always, if you know what you're doing and see that I don't, leave me a comment. I just recently started buying parts for this engine, and yikes, this is going to be really pricey. So I'm thinking about what the shortest path is by dollars spent. If you have spare scuba tanks lying around, an extra adjustable regulator or two, or know where I could find a bunch of AN fittings, and you'd be willing to share, let me know. Thank you again to everyone watching this video. I'm aiming to do weekly updates over the summer, so stay tuned, and I'll see you next week.